So just when you thought that photosynthesis was over, there's C4 and CAM pathways to study. So let's do it. Hi guys, my name is Mikey from Avo Prep Academy and I hope you've been following our photosynthesis series for the last week or so. We've been pumping out a lot of content over the last couple of days on the photosynthetic pathways. And in this last extra video, I want to talk to you guys about the C4 and CAM pathways that sort of comes at the end of this photosynthesis lecture. Now, everything that we've been talking about thus far with the light reaction and Calvin cycle has been relatively applicable across all of the different species of plants, but the Calvin cycle in particular, where we have the Rubisco enzyme joining carbon dioxide and RUBP into that six carbon intermediate is really something that happens in C3 plants immediately during the initial carbon fixation process. Now, I know that already sounds a little bit weird, but I'm gonna come back to that point towards the end of the video, but let's just talk a little bit about Rubisco because we need to understand one of the main drawbacks of Rubisco in order to understand why C4 and CAM pathways are happening in the first place. Starting with Rubisco, it stands for ribulose 1,5-bisphosphate carboxylase oxygenase, which means that this is an enzyme that has the capacity to both fix carbon or oxygen onto our RUBP molecule. Now, you might wonder, well, how does it make that decision? Well, as you guys probably already know, Rubisco doesn't have a mind of its own, which can decide whether it's going to fix carbon or oxygen. Rather, it's going to make that decision based on what is more abundant or readily available. Now, I don't mean absolute concentrations of CO2 and O2, because clearly in any atmospheric concentration, we're gonna be looking at a lot more oxygen than CO2, which is typically measured in parts per million. However, relatively speaking, we can use terms like partial pressure in order to understand understand that if there's a relatively high amount of CO2 in the gas sample, Rubisco is going to do its thing and fix carbon dioxide onto REBP. But if there's a relatively high concentration of oxygen in a gas sample, then it's going to be fixing oxygen onto REBP, which incidentally is counterproductive to carbon fixation and producing sugar. That process of fixing oxygen to REBP is called photorespiration and is generally thought of as a bad thing for the plant. So why is this even an issue? Isn't there always going to be relatively high amounts of CO2 in the atmosphere, especially with climate change? Well, let's think about this for a moment. If we take a look at that gross anatomy of the plant that we've been looking at, you'll notice that at the bottom of the leaves, typically, we have these openings called the stomata. Now, the stomata are surrounded by specialized cells called guard cells that can expand or collapse, either opening or closing the stomata, depending on the needs of the plant. So let's talk about what actually occurs through the stomata. You guys know that the chemical reaction for photosynthesis has CO2 on the reactant side and O2 on the product side, which means means that as photosynthesis takes place, CO2 is used up and O2 is produced. However, to reset the gas concentrations within the leaf tissue and therefore in the mesophyll cells, the stomata remain open, allowing a free flow of gas exchange, leading to CO2 coming in and O2 leaving, constantly allowing Rubisco to have enough CO2 to perform its function normally. However, here's what also happens to the stomata. Through the process of what we call transpiration, water is drawn from the roots all the way to the stomata where water will form a continuous column as it exits the plant. This is normally a good thing because this allows water to be translocated from the soil all the way to the top of the canopy. However, on really hot, dry, sunny days, the rate of transpiration becomes too much and the plants are now at danger of desiccation or drying out. Now, when this happens, there is an automated system that tells the guard cells to collapse and close the stomata in order to reduce the water loss from the plant, thereby conserving moisture within the organism. Now that doesn't sound like a bad adaptation, and in fact, it's a great one. But going back to that original equation of photosynthesis, if photosynthesis continues to take place with the stomata closed, then CO2 is gonna continue to be used up by the photosynthetic reaction, resulting in a continually decreasing CO2 concentration. On the other hand, the product of photosynthesis, that is oxygen, continues to increase as the photosynthetic reaction continues onwards. However, at some point, the CO2 levels drop too low and the O2 levels increase to a too high a level where we pass that critical threshold where Rubisco will begin to fix oxygen onto REBP instead of CO2 resulting in photorespiration. 
Now, normally this isn't so bad for plants that live in temperate climates. So most of the trees and the wildflowers that you see out there are going to be your normal run of the mill C3 plants that don't need to have any specific adaptations to deal with this very hot, arid climate. However, plants that are growing in grasslands, for example, in the plains of Canada and the United States, we're gonna see a lot of hot, dry days in the summer. And these grass species have developed an adaptation called the C4 pathway to deal with the problem of rubisco. So let's take a look at what the C4 pathway is all about. So for grasses, you probably already know that the blades of the grass leaves look a little bit different. And inside, there is more difference yet because grasses have developed a specialized cell called the bundle sheath cell, which is then connected to the proper mesophyll cells via plasmodesmata, which are openings between plant cells. Now what happens is that the initial carbon fixation, as in how carbon dioxide as an inorganic molecule enters the organic sphere for the very first time, actually is separated from the Calvin cycle spatially. That means that the initial capture of CO2 into an acid happens in the mesophyll cell. And then the remaining Calvin cycle happens in the bundle sheath cell. So let's see why that plays a critical role in helping Rubisco do what it's supposed to do. So in the mesophyll cell, we have carbon dioxide and oxygen, just like you would see, but with the stomata closed, we might see high levels of oxygen and relatively low levels of carbon dioxide. But that's okay, because the enzyme that we use for the initial carbon fixation in the mesophyll cell is called the PEP carboxylase. Now, you can notice right away that the name of this enzyme indicates that this enzyme only carboxylizes and does not oxygenate. As in what they do is they take a molecule called PEP or PEP and adds that carbon dioxide forming what we call oxaloacetate or oxaloacetic acid. Now, oxaloacetate is converted into malate and malate is then pushed through the plasma desmata into our bundle sheath cell. Now, as it enters the bundle sheath cell, it then segregates into pyruvate and that CO2 that we initially captured is then released once again. And that allows pyruvate to return to our mesophyll cell via the plasma desmata and be used again in a cycle of reactions. Now what's happening here is that the entire system is pumping, is pumping CO2 into the bundle sheath cell via malate as CO2 is captured. It's almost like an air conditioning machine that pumps cold air into a single room while venting out hot air into the other room. Now within the bundle sheath cell, the Calvin cycle can take place as normal because Rubisco operating would have sufficient CO2 concentration levels above that of oxygen, allowing Rubisco to properly fix carbon dioxide onto RUBP. So yes, it does cost a little bit of energy. When we return pyruvate into PEP, it's gonna cost us some ATP. But that being said, that is way better than wasting energy and time and our enzymes in that photorespiratory process in the absence of high CO2 concentrations. So I hope that made sense for the C4. Now what's going on with CAM? Well, while C4's initial carbon fixation happened spatially distant from the Calvin cycle, in the case of the CAM pathway, we're gonna see a temporal separation, which means a time difference in when the carbon is initially fixed and when it's actually fixed into sugars via the Calvin cycle. With CAM plants, we're looking at some really extreme conditions like that of the desert. So we're looking at plants that are succulents or what we call cacti, and these plants will actually only open their stomata at nighttime when the temperature is cool and the air is a little bit more moist. And during this time, it's going to fix as much carbon dioxide into an organic acid called the crassulation acid as much as possible. And when the sun rises, it will then close the stomata to reduce water loss and slowly convert that acid back into CO2, therefore allowing Calvin cycle to happen normally, even with the stomata closed and without the gases resetting to their levels on the outside. Now, we don't have to know the detailed chemical reactions that occur in the CAM pathway or the metabolism system. However, it's useful to know that unlike the C3 pathway, both C4 and CAM utilizes other enzymes and other substrates to initially fix carbon during that very first initial carbon fixation stage in order to save it and make it available either spatially or temporally distinct from the Calvin cycle to allow for photosynthesis to efficiently occur within drier climates. So I hope this short video can clear up some of the misconceptions and confusions that you might have had about the CAM and the C4 pathway. And if you have any questions, please be sure to leave them in the comments and I'll try to get to as many of them as possible. 
This has been Mikey with Avil Prep Academy. We hope to see you soon in our next series of videos on glycolysis and the cell respiration process. We'll see you very soon in the next video.